in, during this summer, what we have been doing is we've been going through the books of First and Second Thessalonians. First and Second Thessalonians. So if you would like to follow along, there's a bunch of Bibles sitting around. Just go ahead and grab that, and you can, you can find one. And uh, you can find we are on Second Thessalonians chapter 3, which means that this is the last, the last chapter, the last sermon that we're going to be doing in this series. Encouraging health and hope in the church. Uh, the church in Thessalonica, if you remember, uh, Paul uh, had been there for maybe only three weeks. And he had, he had preached, he had taught, he had said a lot of things, and then he had to flee because of other problems. And then the, the, the believers wrote to him and they had some issues. And so uh, Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians to try to clarify some of the teaching. And now uh, he wrote 2 Thessalonians, and he, it was only a, a month or so in between of sending 1 Thessalonians that he wrote 2 Thessalonians. Uh, not very long, but he wanted to add to the teaching. And so now he's coming, we're coming to chapter 3. And I don't know if Paul knew that this was the last opportunity he would have to, to write to the Thessalonians or to communicate with them or not. But if this was you, and you were writing to them, and this was your last little segment. You only, you know, you're writing on this uh, scroll, and you only have this much left on the scroll. What are you going to put on there? What do you want them to remember? Now, let me give you a clue here. Uh, Paul doesn't want to introduce a lot of new things. He just wants to remind them of some of the things that he had already taught them. And that's what we're going to see in chapter 3. In chapter 3. Now, you may not know this, but our daughter Abigail, our firstborn, uh, spent three weeks with us this summer. Uh, we were given the privilege of having an apartment right basically on the Promenade des Anglais. Uh, a French couple uh, lent us their apartment for these seven weeks, and there was a guest room. And as soon as our daughter Abigail heard there was a guest room. She made plans to show up, and it was marvelous. It really was marvelous. Uh, you know, your, your children are always your children, even if they're already in their 30s. Uh, and she left yesterday, and both Kathy and I were sad. We're sad. Now, I started a tradition with my daughter Abigail when she started to go to university. She did uh, international school. Uh, she did all of her schooling in France. We basically grew up in the Lyon area where I was pastoring a French church and then an international church. And she left France to go to London because she thought the schools in London were better than anywhere else. I don't know, excuse her, I don't know all this sort of stuff. Uh, she got accepted to a London School of Economics and Political Science, which is actually is a pretty good school. And, uh, but the tradition I started with her it was very simple. I would tell her, don't forget. Don't forget. But I never told her what not to forget. But understood in there, she knew because we had talked about it. Don't forget that Papa loves you no matter what. I will always love you. And to me, that is a message here that is kind of similar to what the Apostle Paul is telling the Thessalonians now. He is wanting them to remember the message. The message. What is the message specifically? Well, we can turn there if you, if you want to follow along in your own Bibles or if you have an electronic device and it's easy to find, you know, go ahead. If, uh, if you're in a, a regular Bible, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Timothy, and I could go on. I won't. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. For not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. 
And we have confidence in the Lord about you, that you are doing and will do the things that we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor we worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. The Lord be with you all. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. This is the sign of genuineness in every letter of mine. It is the way I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Father, thank you for your word. Bless it, Lord. Amen. The ESV Bible, which I use and which is on the chairs in front of you, already divides up this chapter into three sections. And uh, I like those sections well enough that I'm just leaving them the way they are. And uh, that's the way it is. I'm calling the first section, Remember the Messenger. Remember the Messenger. The next section, Remember the Teachings with all its details. And then the last section, Remember God's Promises. Remember the Messenger. Remember the Teaching with all its details. And then third, Remember God's Promises. Last week, when we did the last part of chapter 2, Remember how we were talking about how Paul exhorted the Thessalonians to believe the truth, to guard the truth, and to practice the truth. Now, he ends that chapter by saying, you need to be doers of the word and not just hearers of the word. In other words, it needs to go from here to here to here and to your feet. You need to be doing what you hear. So Paul is using chapter 3 now to remind people of different aspects of this message. But it all starts by simply remembering the message. The message is the most important part of this chapter. Let's read verse 1 again. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you. Finally. This introduces the last major section of this letter. Instead of just telling the Thessalonians that they would be praying for them, Paul begins by asking them to pray. This is important for each of us to understand. No matter our circumstances, we have a duty to pray for others and their needs, and not just to pray for our own problems. Paul starts by asking the Thessalonians to pray for him. But did you notice that the main purpose was prayer regarding the word of the Lord. Paul is specifically asking prayer for two things here. First, that the word of the Lord may speed ahead. Paul does not want the spread of the word to be slowed down or hindered in any way, but he wants it to speed ahead. And secondly, Paul is wanting prayer so that the word of the Lord is honored. Speed ahead and to be honored. The spreading of the gospel was God's work. And its reception among those who heard it 
was due to his, God's, preparing people's hearts. The Thessalonians knew from their experiences how God works in people's hearts to prepare them to receive the gospel so they could pray with conviction that God would honor his word by causing others who heard it to also believe it. But Paul is definitely asking the Thessalonians also here to pray for the messenger, to pray for the messenger of the message here. He says, pray for us, meaning those who are teaching the message. In this case, it would be Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. And you can look at the beginning of the, the, the epistle to see that. But let's reread verses 1 to the beginning of verse 3 here. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. For not all have faith, but the Lord is faithful. In many ways, Paul is showing us here an important Christian reality. We all need prayer. We all need prayer. It doesn't matter how spiritual you are, how many academic degrees you may have, or how long you have been a believer. We are all equal before the Lord. We are all sinners saved by grace. And all of us need prayer. We are all susceptible to falling into sin. This also shows us the humility of Paul not wanting to put himself any higher than anyone else. But Paul realizes this, and he humbly asks people to pray for him. Paul knows that among the people that he deals with are some people who are, and he calls them here, wicked and evil. The hardest thing for a pastor, and I can speak from personal experience of over 30 years of this, is dealing with people who attack your character from within the church, within the church. And it's these people that Paul is referring to here. Remember, Paul is writing both 1st and 2nd Thessalonians because of false teachers who were spreading rumors about the day of the Lord. At first it was the day of the Lord is already happening and you're having this grand, a lot of persecution because this is the end times and all this. And Paul, so Paul wrote 2nd Thessalonians to, to combat that. But there are still evil people there. Paul knows that the Thessalonians will be delivered from the wicked and evil men because the Lord God is faithful. Nevertheless, this does not take away from Paul realizing that he needs prayer as a messenger of the gospel, the truth of God. Paul continues this focus by saying how the Lord will also establish and guard the Thessalonians from the evil one. When what Paul is saying here is that the Thessalonians are also messengers themselves. Paul later tells Timothy this very explicitly in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men and women who will be able to teach others also. And so Paul is saying that, hey, I've taught you this. You also have to be the messenger. You have a responsibility to pass this along. So, in order to understand that a little bit better, look at verses 3 to 5 again. But the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord about you, that you are doing and will do the things that we command. May the Lord direct your hearts to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. Paul had confidence that his readers would not yield to Satan but would permit the faithful Lord to establish them and guard them from the evil one. We can have confidence in God for ourselves and for others. It is not enough that the pastor or the church officers alone share the word. Each Christian must be part of this vital ministry. The word command, command that Paul used in verse 4 here, is actually a military word that is, that is used when a superior officer passes something down to someone who is underneath them in the military. This word command is actually used four times in this one chapter. Four times in this one chapter. Here in verse 4, verse 6, verse 10, and verse 12. Now that would be an excellent study to talk about all those. 
I'm not going to do that, so that gives you some homework for the rest of the day. But uh, you can, we can talk about that later. It's not just the officers who fight in a battle. Everyone, every soldier must do their duty. And this is the true work in the church as well. Everyone in the church has a duty to do. So we remember the message and remember the messenger. Pray for them. Now, in the next section, verses 6 to 15, Paul continues his exhortation about the message, specifically telling the Thessalonians, remember his teachings and the details that go with it. If you want to have people who have, have a good experience in sharing the message, they need to remember the details that keep things running smoothly. How many of you have ever had a small thorn or a sliver in one of your fingers? You know, it's just a small little thing in one of your fingers. Now, my question is this. Do you leave it there because it's so small? It's not worth handling. No, it's so small. No, you don't leave it there. Why? Because it will become infected and it, it, <laughs> it, it, it swells up. And it, it infects your whole hand and then your whole arm. You have to take it out. This is kind of the same principle that Paul is trying to introduce here. But let's look at this. And I want to read this passage again, starting in verse 6. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labor we worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him, that he may be ashamed. Do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. The small thorn that is being talked about here is what is known as the lazy Christian. Some people would say that that is actually an oxymoron, meaning that it doesn't make any sense. Because God's command to his followers is that they should all be busy working at spreading his message and not to be a burden to anyone around them. Remember that this was an issue that resulted from the false teachings that the day of the Lord was going to happen so soon that some people thought that they should all stop their work and to make sure that they were ready for the return of Christ. Well, their timing was totally off. And as a result, they ended up relying on others for their own living needs. And so Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians 4 and 5 about those details, but apparently his warnings from that were not taken to heart, and now it's continuing. The false teaching regarding the day of the Lord was causing problems. There had been those who said that the day of the Lord had already taken place, and now it was that people were not doing any work because since it hadn't taken place, it was sure to happen soon. Church problems are like physical problems. If left unsolved, they grow and become worse, and they infect more and more people. They must be dealt with properly. The problem was not in helping to feed those people who are hungry. Jesus taught that his followers should help feed the hungry. There are plenty of examples throughout the Bible of helping to feed the hungry people. The issue here is that people who refuse to work because they just don't want to work should not expect to get hands out, handouts from the church. But some people know how to beat the system, how to get around the system, and their life ends up showing that this is what they're actually doing. And we know, we know who those people are after a while. You, you understand it. 
Paul calls them here busybodies. The Greek definition of the word busybody, if you look at the Greek definition, it's someone who does nothing but meddles in the affairs of others, telling them what they ought to do. Okay, it doesn't really pertain to them, but they just they want to tell you what you ought to do. That's a busybody. What Paul does in this passage is to remind the Thessalonians about church discipline. And it's actually fairly simple. The leaders were to separate the lazy believers, the troublemakers, from the rest of the believers and not let them participate in regular life and meetings in the church. The idea was not to ostracize them, but to make them embarrassed so that they would repent from that life. Paul adds to this by telling them they should actually imitate how Paul himself worked, using himself as an example to the tradition that the believers had been taught. How the Apostle Paul worked is important for us to understand. Verses 7 and 8 say, For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. Paul worked without expecting any recognition. He did it simply because that's what he wanted to do so that he wouldn't be a burden to anyone and so that he could eat. The second thing that Paul did was he did this work because he knew that it would benefit others. Others wouldn't have to take care of him. He was offering his message as a free gift to others. When Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, God did not come along and curse work. No. He did put a curse on the ground, meaning that it would be harder to make a living. But it was still a responsibility that was given to Adam and Eve to work the land, to work the ground responsibility there. And God asks us to keep working ourselves. He says that for six days people should labor and then they should rest on the seventh day. But that means that there's six for working. Now we can debate all that. That's whatever. So people who are lazy believers were seen as sinning and they had to be dealt with. But notice that Paul's instructions here are for how all believers are to treat the lazy Christian or the troublemaker. They are supposed to be unified in their treatment of this person. There is not supposed to be different ways to treat them. In other words, your group here, the believers, are not supposed to be divided. This group treats them nicely and this one, no. Uh -uh. You're supposed to be united in how church discipline is done. That means the church leaders decide together the proper steps to take and then they tell people, this is what we are doing, this is what we want you to do. But Paul closes off this section. He says, As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. Verse 13. Paul was encouraging all the believers to continue in what they knew to be right. Even if lazy people seemed to be, to be prospering. When other so-called Christians take an easy path and seem to prosper, it's easy for us to become discouraged and to be tempted to join them. Though one may tire in doing what is right, one should never tire or grow weary of doing what is right. Paul then gives a general statement regarding those who don't obey what Paul has written about. This obedience applies to all of the things that Paul has written about, not just the lazy believer here, but all of the things pertaining that you find in 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. He says, just as them, but those who are troublemakers in other ways, those who are not leading a chaste life, those who disrespect the church leaders, all of that, there is something, a specific way that you are to treat them. But Paul is also wanting to make sure that people don't overdo this discipline. They are not to treat the troublemakers as enemies, he says here, which would be the natural result, the natural inclination that humans have to go to extremes. But they are to treat them as fallen brothers, to treat them as brothers who need to repent and need to be brought back into fellowship. 
And this requires much patience and love and mercy and grace and is a good reminder for all of us how we are to treat people who have wronged us. So we've seen Paul challenging the Thessalonians to remember the message and its messengers, to remember the message with all of the details. And now Paul is going to challenge the Thessalonians to remember the message of God's promises. And this is found in the last three verses, 16 to 18. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace in all times, in every way. The Lord be with you all. I, Paul, write these greetings with my own hand. This is the sign of genuineness in every letter of mine. It is the way I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Paul closes this chapter with a prayer, a final greeting, and a benediction. Paul prays that this church that has known persecution and not known much peace will actually be given peace. A Christian and a church enjoy peace when they are doing God's will. But this does not mean that this peace will mean no trouble, but that the peace of God will wash over those believers and they will experience unity and love in the middle of whatever situation they find themselves. Then Paul gives his personal greetings, which is written by his own hand and is proof of who actually wrote this letter. The benediction, the very last phrase, is very similar to what you find in 1 Thessalonians. Turn, turn back just a couple of pages or one page to 1 Thessalonians, the very last verse. What do you notice is different? That was a question. I'm expecting an answer. Okay. Uh, turn back to the end of 1 Thessalonians, the very last sentence there. Compare it to the last sentence here. What is different? Amanda. Wow. It says all. Otherwise, it's the exactly same benediction. The exactly same benediction. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And here it says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Slight difference, but a huge implication. A huge implication. Because when you end with you, you're talking me, personal, singular. When it says you all, all of a sudden you are part of the combined. You're part of the church. It's Paul's wish that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with all of you. You are not alone. You are in this together. And that is very important. Now, in conclusion today, I just want to take a few comments, make a few comments about, about this passage. Remember the message. This means that we have to know what the message really is. We have to know what the message is. What have Pastor James and myself told you several times during this summer when we've been going to this? We need to be Bereans. Remember the Bereans? When Paul teached in Berea, they listened to him. And when Paul got done, they went back to their homes to study the scriptures on their own. We need to be Bereans. We need to have this message inside of us. We need to know what the main doctrines of this message is is those things that we can never compromise on, like the inspiration of Scripture. All Scripture is inspired by God. We cannot compromise on that. Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. Grace is the only means of receiving salvation. Salvation by faith and not by works. And there are other things. But do we know what the main things are? Do we study them? Secondly, do we remember the messenger? Do we remember the messenger? Paul asked for prayer. If Paul needed prayer, how much more do our messengers need prayer? Do we pray for Pastor James? He's been here 15 years, 16 years, a, a long time, a long time. Do we pray for him that he will remain true to the message? 
that he will be protected from the evil one, that he will be faithful to God's call, that God will continue to establish him in his faith. It is a process, even for someone like him, like myself. It is a process. Do you pray that his family will be protected, that he will find joy in serving the Lord and in serving us? And how are we at being messengers ourselves? We also have a responsibility to proclaim God's truth. Peter wrote about this. Always be prepared to give an answer for the hope that is within you. But do it with gentleness and respect. How are we? Are we faithfully proclaiming God's truth? Remember the details of the message. Those little things that help the church function smoothly. This again reminds me of Pastor James. And... Uh, you know, it's probably good he's not here to hear all this. Uh, I have really found Pastor James to be a remarkable person. A remarkable person. I have enjoyed tremendously the three years that I've been able to work with him. He's a remarkable teacher of God's word. He has a gift like I have seen very rarely. He works at spreading the message, the truth, without complaining and without wanting to draw attention to himself. He always says, less of me, more of him. He says that all the time. He's always saying, pray for me. I really need it. Yeah. He is willing to sacrifice his time and efforts to help out the people in his flock. He will even go on trips for them if they need to. Rumor has it that he actually drove someone to the edge of Ukraine. <laughs> Proof. Absolutely amazing person. He is definitely not a lazy Christian. He is not a busybody. How are we at doing the little details? Are we also studying the Bible to try to make it a benefit like the Bereans? Finally, remembering God's promises. God will give us peace in the midst of the storms that we have. Do we live life like that? Or do we let our burdens and our concerns and all the way to the world that is right before us, do we let that control our lives? It should not. Because God has won. Jesus has won. Jesus has defeated Satan. That means that we need to show grace to each other. Because grace has been shown to us. If we are showing that grace to each other, we need to guard the unity that we have being part of God's family together, showing the love of Christ for each other.